and how will this prosperity collaborative based on sound digital science, which is relatively new, work towards that? And as Tuan said, our keynote speaker, of course, is uh, Dr. Alex Bentland, who has spent a great deal of time and thought, and if I may say so, care on the subject. Please share with us, Sandy, your perceptions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's really interesting to frame today in this context of what happened in 1945 and what will happen, hopefully, in 2045 and, and where are we going. Um, because time is short, I'll go relatively fast. Uh, but I wanted to show you a couple of ideas about what we think are interesting ideas for a uh, global digital common. Let me see if I can make this work. Okay. Yes, I'm presenting. That's correct. Oops. Sorry. Um, one of the things that I don't do very often is I don't do uh, Google all that often. So it's a little difficult for me, different. So um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about uh, the notion of a digital common is that suddenly we have this resource, which is data and AI. Uh, we didn't have that really in 1945. And the fact that we're doing this at all shows the power of that. And um, I think that, that uh, it's a follow on to progress we've made in this area with GDPR, which I was proud to help start the discussion. And, and also um, what the UN, uh, previous UN Secretary General called the data revolution. Uh, and this has of course shaped the, the SDGs by providing metrics to be able to know where we're going. And, and there's been a lot of research in this area, uh, uh, much of which I've helped uh, uh, move along, showing that you can measure inequality, you can measure and predict crime, you can uh, do a much better job of infrastructure, uh, saving money, making things effective, public health, uh, we saw that most clearly in some of the pandemic things, planning transport by using data uh, that is uh, safe because it's not about individuals, it's about census blocks. It comes from many different sources, uh, but we've been able to put this up. And this part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is that countries are supposed to begin doing this and in fact are doing these sorts of measurements along many things more than just population and GDP. Um, and I view the, the uh, collaborative here, the Prosperity Collaborative, which we're very proud to be part of, um, as trying to harness the pieces of this that really need to be in common. So one of the things that was multilateral in uh, 1945 was the financial agreements. So the World Bank, the uh, uh, peg to gold and the dollar, uh, things like that were necessary collaborations between nations who gave up some sovereignty to do this. Um, but it meant that uh, we could all grow together instead of failing individually. And I think we're at a place where the new type of capital that we have, which is not money but data, can be harnessed in a similar way. Um, concerns, of course, about this, how can we avoid Big Brother solutions? And the solution that uh, we've been coming up with and have been able to convince people like the EU to adopt and the large American banks to adopt and recently Google to adopt is not to make big uh, data lakes, but rather to set up uh, networks that uh, send questions back and forth, authenticated questions back and forth, uh, so that there's no uh, uh, big brother in there uh, to uh, control control them all. And, and this is familiar to us in the uh, financial system when we pay with a credit card. We go to a merchant, we give them this inscrutable number. What that does is it tells the identity provider, which is MasterCard or someone like that, which bank to ask about this purchase. The bank looks at your private data, but doesn't share it with anybody. 
and says yes or no, and then that answer is transmitted back to the merchant. The merchant doesn't know your bank, doesn't know your uh, account. Um, the identity provider knows very, very little about you too, only knows one of your banks and, and the price that you just paid. Um, so it's privacy preserving, and yet it's, and it's distributed because there are many different sorts of banks, um, and yet it's very reliable. And we are beginning to talk about doing the same thing for health data, and there's a discussion currently about vaccine passports, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, social payments are being done this way in many countries around the world. So if you put those all together, that's what's called digital identity, and it's part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And McKinsey estimates that it would add 3 to 13% to GDP by 2030. So if I may interrupt you for a second, Sandy, are you uh, scrolling the slides? Because we are still on the first slide. Oh, yeah, I am. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, can you see the second slide there? Yes. Okay. Well, so sorry. I'll just do it this way then. I don't know why Google is uh, doing that. So so the, the, um, the idea here is that uh, the sorts of things that we saw for credit cards can be expanded to not just do money in a privacy preserving way, but to do health data and others. And um, the more interesting thing that's happened today is that several countries, trade countries, have uh, put these systems together and they intend them to be uh, public goods, but not entirely public goods because they would retain governance. So, uh, for instance, the Swiss, we helped the Swiss set up something called Swiss Trust Chain, which is a mechanism for moving data of all sorts, money, uh, health data, anything else, uh, using a blockchain system, an extremely efficient, reliable system with uh, multiple ledgers. And uh, this is supported by the Swiss Post and Swisscom and the stock exchange there. Uh, and uh, provides a mechanism, a unified mechanism, for uh, all sorts of data governance. Singapore has done the same. They have a project called UBIN. It's funded by their Sovereign Wealth Fund, which has enormous investments in the Indo-Pacific area, um, and includes provision for central bank digital currencies. So this is another thing that's changing, is, is, is that as currencies become general, uh, digital, they become something that becomes much more fungible and much harder to control once they're on these sorts of platforms. So control of the platforms matter. And of course, China has perhaps the most advanced version of this, where they're not only having their sort of smart city platform, but their digital currency. And, and they're piloting this on you know, 150, 200 million people for several years now. And of course, the question comes up is, well, this is great. It has much greater security. You get much better harnessing of the power of data, but who controls it? What is the privacy questions? And so on and so forth. And, and that's, I think, one of the things that the, I hope that the Prosperity Collaborative will really think about. A question that always comes up is how can we control AI? And, and my observation is, is that AI is simply patterns in data. If you audit the data, if you audit the decisions made by the AI, then you can audit whether things are going as you intended. And in fact, we have done this uh, for countries, Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. Oops, sorry, wrong, wrong direction here. Um, and for instance, in Colombia, we discovered that the, the, sort of expert system they had for allocating social payments uh, was not very accurate when it came to rural uh, communities. And by uh, comparing the data and the decisions made against sort of a gold standard, we were able to show that they were uh, not giving benefits to almost a million people who should have been getting benefits uh, and giving benefits incorrectly to uh, a pe million people that shouldn't have been getting benefits. So this sort of path forward is, is I think, a very practical way uh, to be able to control AI. 
Um, one of the key elements in all of this is, is not just empowering the big guys, the national governments, but also individual communities. And I think this is something that in poverty alleviation efforts is, is really a, a, a well-known message and very central. And I think that if you think about data as this new resource that we have, um, then you say, well, maybe what will happen with that is the same thing that happened with money and labor. So for instance, in the US, um, money used to be controlled by a very few banks and all of the farmer uh, and farming communities felt they were getting uh, uh, really uh, destroyed. So they created their own banks. They banded together, the community banded together to control the money. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, you saw the same thing with labor. Large corporations were exploiting workers, so they banded together to control that means of production. And what we're beginning to see now is that communities are banding together to control their own data. And uh, this is actually uh, part and parcel of the EU 2021 regulations, strongly encouraged there. The California privacy law encourages that. We're working with... Uh, fairly serious legal efforts to be able to make this as automatic and convenient as possible. And to give you a sense of what this means, let me just illustrate. So we're all familiar with the idea of census blocks having data. So how many people live there, how many, uh, uh, what age distribution, perhaps what wealth. But if we can also add some other information to that, information that is not threatening of individuals, uh, for instance, where do people in the community work? Where do they shop? Um, what sort of jobs do they have? These are things that are not available to uh, communities today anywhere in the world. And yet, let me show you what you can do with them. Just with that information, uh, we've been able to, for instance, predict year-on-year -year economic growth for each neighborhood. So a neighborhood could look at this and say, huh, look at the pattern of where we work, uh, what are the stores, who comes to our neighborhood, because that's the information that you need. And based on that, we can predict the income growth in our neighborhood. And it's a larger factor than the things you talk about typically, which is investment and education and, and, and crime. It counts, it is the largest single factor in economic growth. And yet people don't have uh, access to this sort of data. Uh, similarly, if you look at the jobs within a community, it turns out that the pattern of skills is critical. So this is data from the entire United States showing that if you have good uh, fabric of skills, so there's lots of overlap between jobs, which means the jobs uh, are a little bit similar to each other in the community, then when you get a recession like 2008, the people can move from one job to the other pretty easily because they share skills between these jobs. And this shows the, the unemployment rate in the United States for each community versus how well distributed their jobs are. So what this means is that community colleges, planners, uh, entrepreneurs need to look at the distribution of skills in the community to be able to make the community resilient. And of course, currently, they don't have that data at all. Um, other things, like for instance, this is a study of the lockdowns in, in Colombia uh, during the pandemic. And it turns out that the patterns of commuting were the greatest factor in economic impact. So in cities where you had lots and lots of people working in the rich zones as restaurants, uh, employees, and other sort of servants, uh, uh, service personnel, those were the ones where the poorer people suffered the most. Now, when they plotted these and planned these lockdowns, they didn't think about the fact <clears throat> that all the rich people would work from home, which would throw all the poor people in those neighborhoods out of work. Uh, but it turns out that that was actually a bigger factor in economic impact than the lockdown itself. So I'll just stop there. Uh, I'll mention that I have a book online, Building the New Economy, talks about many of these things. It's free uh, at MIT. 
And I will stop there in the interest of time. So hopefully that is, we're all back. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Dr. Benkel. And uh, I, I was struck by that, uh, the, I'm not sure if the word is tension or the, or the relationship between the two extremes you mentioned, the anonymity of the credit card, which protects the consumer from a possibly uh, de uh, deprivatory merchant, and the ubiquity of data, which allows so much of our lives to be in the public space or in the space of someone who wants to influence it. And I also take the very important point that you made about uh, using or aggregating data for larger conclusions. And I think this is a, a wonderful point to introduce uh, Dr. Tomika Tilleman because he's been working with the World Bank, uh, the World Food Program Innovation Advisory Council. And one of the major innovations of the World Food Program has come up with because of data in the last 10 or 15 years is being able to use completely external data or possibly seemingly irrelevant data to be able to protect areas where there's going to be a food shortage or where you need to get food supplies in. So that's really the part of data. Not to speak also of the, the anonymity that you mentioned, uh, Sandy, of the, of the donor, um, the, the idea that uh, Dr. Tilleman has worked on in the State Department, not just of diplomacy, but working on initiatives in countries which are clearly initiatives by the United States government, but which the beneficiaries don't necessarily connect with the United States because they see they see the roads, which you mentioned, sir, that Ashraf Ghani talked about in Afghanistan, but they don't really know whose money or whose labor paved those roads. So it's going to be an extremely complex idea in this prosperity collaborative where people will either get credit for what they've done or not get credit, and where the degree of collaboration will have to reconcile both anonymity and ubiquity, I think. But may I ask you, if I, Dr. Tillman, for your thoughts? Well, it's very kind. I appreciate the, the generous introduction and Sandy's superb uh, framing of these issues uh, beforehand. Um, I highlight a couple of opportunities and challenges as, as we address these issues. Um, the first is, you know, as, as you said a moment ago, there's an old saying in, in Washington, you can accomplish anything if you don't care about who gets the credit. Uh, and credit and, and attribution around information and data are really going to be fundamental. And managing those issues, and Sandy alluded to this, will be one of the defining challenges of our time. Uh, and the issue in, in my mind will ultimately come down to what model of technical innovation is best suited for harnessing information effectively and specifically uh, marrying data and artificial intelligence while still protecting and preserving individual rights uh, and uh, you know, basic fundamental liberties uh, that are enshrined in, uh, in UN documents. Uh, and so that is the challenge we're going to be up against. And I think the, the question of what model is going to succeed in that regard uh, is still wide open. Uh, in my mind, there are a few big opportunities. Uh, the first is we are seeing the marriage of a number of different technologies that were developed separately that are now coming together. Uh, so tools like federated learning uh, and differential privacy and homomorphic encryption, all of which are still frankly pretty fringe uh, leading edge technologies are starting to be integrated uh, into uh, common applications and common platforms. What those tools should enable us to do if uh, we get that, uh, that marriage right is perform very complex analysis on very large pools of data while still preserving the privacy and anonymity of individuals who are contributing that data. Uh, that's going to be one of the defining tasks of our time. So we've, we've got to figure out how to do that and do it well. Uh, but if we succeed, we should be able to radically expand the universe of information that is available uh, to society to, to leverage uh, in making public sector decisions, uh, but also in developing uh, new solutions in, in the private sector, new solutions around business models and, and trade, uh, and uh, new solutions for gathering taxation effectively and, and putting tax dollars to work effectively. So there are extraordinary opportunities if we get that right. 
that will not happen uh, in, in my mind without the creation of a new layer of digital public infrastructure that is specifically designed to unlock the potential of these new tools. Um, so what we have seen historically is that every time there is a breakthrough in innovation, it must be matched in the space of a few decades with a serious investment in infrastructure and regulation if you're going to be able to achieve the potential of that innovation. And I'll give just a, uh, two historical examples on this. If you look at automobiles and aviation, both of which were some of the defining technologies of the 20th century, we had big breakthroughs uh, in planes and cars, and cars and planes got a lot better very rapidly. But societies were not able to realize the full potential of those technologies until there was corresponding investment in highways and airports. And you needed to have that second stage of investment and also an investment in the regulatory framework that would give people confidence that the aircraft that they were stepping onto would land safely or that the car that they were stepping into uh, would drive safely and, and have seat belts that operate and airbags that would protect the occupants. And so we're going to have to now in the aftermath of an enormous wave of innovation uh, in digital technology, where we built out just an incredible array of new tools, start making serious investments in the digital public goods and infrastructure, and also the regulatory framework that will enable us to unlock these broader gains at a societal level. That's going to be a big job. Uh, you have a lot of folks on this call who are at the forefront of efforts uh, to uh, spur those innovations and those investments in uh, infrastructure and regulation. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today on, on how we can make that happen. Thanks so much, Dr. Silliman. And uh, that is a, a wonderful metaphor, the idea that you can create something or invent a vehicle in, in, in a metaphorical sense, but then once you've done this, how do you get it from point A to point B? And if you transfer that to, that was a 20th century metaphor, as you rightly said, if you move it to the 20th century, the 21st century, how do you take the accomplishments of digital science and innovation and then find a platform upon which they could be shared? And your reference to making tax dollars work actually leads us uh, very ably to our next speaker, Dr. Jeff Sabiano, who's a tax innovation lawyer and who has worked uh, also closely with Sandy in this regard. And the idea, which we've again seen over the last one year in the context of the pandemic, how governments and societies suddenly find completely unexpected and very ruinous strains upon the exchequer because of circumstances they cannot control. And to take that a step beyond, will the fact that digital progress and di digital innovation, the fourth industrial revolution to, to quote the World Economic Forum, Will that result in the compulsion of increased investments by governments? And will that mean that they would have to find more and more innovative slash surreptitious ways to tax their citizens? Dr. Saviano? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Tuan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rambu uh, Demodoran. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. It's a very, very important session. and. Uh, it's always so wonderful to follow uh, friends, uh, Dr. Pentland uh, and Dr. Tillerman. We work so closely together on these issues. I'd like to first uh, congratulate the UN and the uh, UNAI, UN Academic Impact, uh, for 10 years of success in uh, getting ready for today's session. Uh, it was wonderful to learn about the uh, uh, great successes that you've had in over 1,400 institutions coming together uh, what an amazing accomplishment and uh, looking forward to many uh, more decades of that success. I practice in the innovation community, the contribution from uh, universities for and around innovation uh, is quite important to finding new solutions to difficult problems. I'm very, very proud to be affiliated with uh, Dr. Pentland's Connection Science Lab and also affiliated with uh, New America uh, and Dr. Tillerman, um, incredibly important role that universities play. 
uh, <clears throat> in innovation. All uh, also very proud to be a member of the Prosperity Collaborative, and it's been an incredible just over a year since we launched at the World Economic Forum uh, in Davos, and these great organizations coming together to influence digital public good development for the adoption of new taxing systems. I loved that uh, the opening of the session as, as we defined uh, enlightenment. It's hard to think of enlightenment without thinking of taxation. Uh, perhaps that's a bit of uh, a bit of a stretch, but uh, we appreciate the role that taxes play uh, in societies. I'd like to focus my remarks today in two particular areas. First, I want to uh, just uh, provide some additional background on, as Tamika laid out so well, the digital infrastructure needs across digital public goods. I also recognize that to some, the the phrase digital public goods may be uh, a bit amorphous. And, uh, and so what do we mean by digital public goods? Uh, as we are within a UN session today, I thought that we would use the UN um, Secretary General's definition in the Great Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. Uh, I'll paraphrase it, but uh, a digital public good is open source software, open data, open standards, and open content that adhere to privacy and other applicable laws, do no harm, and help attain the sustainable development goals. I think it's an I think it's important to ground us today in this discussion. Uh, you heard the word "open" uh, many many times, and we think that's quite important uh, to develop these systems that can be used by multiple nations. I also believe we are at the precipice of a historic wave of government digitalization investment. And this is, of course, accelerated by the pandemic. We have, and this is based on World Bank data, $1.5 trillion of committed capital by eight countries, uh, plus the uh, European Union, and that does not include the US. If you add, we think, this likely US investment, that clearly would uh, exceed $2 trillion. And if you add the rest of the world, we think this is multiple $3 trillion plus committed capital to these digital rails. And I think that's incredibly important as we sit here today uh, in May of 2021, because uh, you know, as Dr. Tillman had laid out, it's those rails that will become incredibly important. Uh, we also believe that we're at a tipping point in uh, 2021 where most governments will embark on some form of digital transformation for tax purposes. And I think that's really important. And in our work, when we look at actions that governments are taking, we really believe that most of them will embark on some form of transforming their governments through these technologies for tax purposes. And there's a reason why governments are very, very focused on tax. Let me just give you two statistics. Uh, the first is that revenue in 30 of the world's 75 poorest countries are uh, inadequate to finance the basic state functions, let alone any additional investment to attain the SDGs. That's, we think that's really important. There is a revenue shortfall. And of course, taxes are the lifeblood to closing that gap. The second statistic I will provide is that uh, this is uh, based on UN research. Achieving the sustainable development goals in the 59 lowest income developing countries will require new capital of about $400 billion a year. That's $400 billion of new capital they need to close the tax gaps that exist in the world. We think that um, uh, this is a critically important field of digital public goods that will be developed. Uh, the last points I want to make today are around uh, one particular type of uh, technology advancement applicable to taxes, and it incorporates some of the points made uh, by Dr. Pentland in the opening and Dr. Tillerman uh, and the review of uh, the relevant technologies. I believe that many uh, new uh, and uh, established technologies are available now to help governments manage their taxing system. I'd like to talk about just one, the development of network-based technology assets. Uh, we believe that uh, tax relevant data will increasingly be managed across distributed technology systems serving multiple stakeholders. And if we compare that to what's happening today, today 
technology systems principally are developed for single parties. They develop for single uh, parties in the private sector or developed for governments themselves. We believe that that will change. And instead of developing technology either for a member of the private sector or uh, contrast that with developing technology for government authorities, we think that that will change and instead will be developing network-based assets, assets to, to uh, in this instance, to help move data across multiple stakeholder networks. Many, many examples within taxation, for example, around withholding taxes and the, the myriad of multiple organizations that have to come together to just withhold the correct taxes. There are many, many separate systems along the way uh, another example is in supply chains and managing customs duties for tax purposes. Instead of managing taxes at each stop of the supply chain, we think that um, the very near future will necessitate a single technology asset in order to manage taxes, taxation across networks. I'm going to pause on uh, on my remarks. I know that we're a bit short of time, but but we're excited to see that as we sit here in still early 2021, that uh, it's happening right before our eyes. There are dozens and dozens of technology projects that have been initiated by nations across the globe. They're initiated on a single country basis. We have taken, uh, using some of our own data analytic um, systems in our lab, we have analyzed all of those projects and there are clear trends and there's clear duplication. There's a need for AI-based systems to make better predictions. There's a need for data sharing platforms to manage data. If we do not intervene and pivot those separate company investments to a digital public good to serve many, we will be, um, we will be promoting these single uh, country projects that um, that will not be the most efficient or effective means to achieve the SDGs. And I'll leave with that remark. I feel so passionate about the need for us at this moment to do something very different. Thank you again for the opportunity to join today. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabiano. That was a that is a very powerful image. The idea of that uh, four hundred billion dollars, which is something which which really leaps out as a figure, but one can't even begin to think of quantifying it in terms of what the precise results will be. And I think that actually takes us back beyond the UN to the to pre-1945 and the and the development of the Bretton Woods institutions, who were really designed, in a sense, to provide that financing for development, but not on the scale or with the potential that we have in 2021. And which is a good point to introduce Dr. Anders Agaskov who is with the World Bank and who's been working on the blending, if you will, of fiscal growth and sustainable growth, and also bringing in the idea of tax and digital innovation into that, which is, again, I dare say, an area which the original drafters of Bretton Woods would not have really focused upon, but which we are in the 21st century. Dr. Agaskov, please, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting us to participate in today's event. Um, I organized uh, more than 20 years ago a workshop on something very innovative at the time. It was called Corporate Social Responsibility. We brought in uh, John Perkins, the author of A Confession of an Economic Hitman. He told the story of him going back to a tribe in Brazil and to reconnect with it. He couldn't find it. Uh, and he finally found it deeper inside the jungle. And he asked the local chief what had happened. And he said, look, in your culture, you have a dream of big cities and cars. And the thing about dreams, they happen. So your challenge is to dream another dream. So right now, we are in front of a large revolution. I think everybody understands that. But what is the dream? What is the dream we need to dream? So let me try to take that abstract thought and drill down in something as esoteric as tax systems and see what will a change agent face working within the tax administration facing uh, this new e economy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, no. Just one second. Let's see if I can figure that out. Uh, tie screen. There we go. OK. 
Can you see this? No. No? Yes? No. No? Not yet. <laughs> Look, I'm just going to talk to it instead. Um, so, what we are seeing happening is that technologies are getting cheaper and more powerful. Again, when we look at the first Intel chip in 71, it has about 2,000 transistors. The latest one has 1.2 trillion. So it's like 500 million times more. It is getting cheaper. And then it also goes into government. So you can actually invest in these things. Uh, at the same time, uh, governments are collecting more data. So in, in, the in the case of the tax administration, for example, in the last 20, 30 years, what we wanted to do is we want to get data on the local taxpayers. Because with that data, we will know how much you should pay in taxes. That makes a lot of sense, right? But what is happening with the new technologies like uh, blockchain? So companies can trade with each other on the blockchain. So it's all in the public. So why should the government take a copy of this and put it into its own system? It doesn't make any sense, right? It's already there. And especially if you know you can trust the data. So that is a major thing. The second thing that occurs is you don't have to submit your tax return. So uh, take, for example, The Economist uh, visited the, the Federal Tax Service of Russia a few years ago, and the journalist had a meeting in the tax service, and, and the uh, tax service asked, so which hotel did you stay at? Well, I stayed at Bristol. Uh, what did they have in morning coffee? And he checked. Uh, did you have one of the three cappuccinos that were sold at the bar that morning? And he said, yes, I did. Right. So that is the future of the economy. And that can be scary or that can be invigorating. So right now, as an official operating this space, you have to think about the system you control and you know that it's not very perfect. You're collecting data. Or should we jump to this new networked economy that's not quite there? That's a risky uh, move uh, politically, you know, and, and how, 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 are you, how are you going to get a guarantee that, that you're going to still get the taxes? And also importantly, you know, when you pay taxes, what happens is you want the government to deliver services, right? So in the U.S., for example, you pay something and then you add the sales tax because the legislators want you to know you're now paying to the government. So you, you have a stake, but if it's invisible, how will that change the, the dynamics? So that is something we need to think about as well. It's not just we're digitizing things. So, so that is the kind of first challenge you're going to face. Then we talk a lot about robots. Uh, you know, AI will make decisions. And one of the challenges we have, we have a little project at the World Bank. And they say, oh, you have to think of bias of AI. So say, OK, we have an, an old system where we say, if what the taxpayer reports as having earned doesn't match uh, what the taxpayer says you have earned, uh, that's a little uh, formula, right? That is okay, but if we use some artificial intelligence, it's not okay. So when does something, a simple comparison, become AI and we get very worried? Add to this, in, in the tax administration, we like to use words like profiling. We like to profile people. But if you go to policing, that is a really bad word, right? In the tax administration, that means you try to go after the more risky. And, and nobody has really scrutinized whether we go after certain minorities and so on, because we just go where the money is, at least we think. So that tends to be rich people or certain parts of the economy. So we need to think about what that really means. And as Sandy will say, we're beginning to develop tools to figure out what the AI systems are saying. We brought a company in a few years ago and they was able to predict with 100% certainty that there was a corruption in a bank finance contract. And we asked why, and the company couldn't say why, right? So that, that's not going to fly. Uh, so, so that needs, we, we, need to, we need to figure that one out. Um, and here comes another potential tension, uh, transparency versus privacy. So everybody likes the trans uh, transparency. Everyone wants to predict data privacy. So when, when is that trade-off? Right? You can get around it in different ways with technology, but we have to figure that out. And sometimes uh, the protection of privacy is also a way to protect your own information. So for example, in one tax administration, I said, why don't you share the data with the Ministry of Finance because they can use it for policymaking and the answer is now we don't do that. 
all but the Sandy Pendlin has developed this uh, smart system where you don't get access to the individual taxpayers' information. No, because data is perceived by some as power, and it is to a certain extent. So how will that play out? So when our audience here gets into these roles, how are you going to play this, right? How are you going to get the alliance behind you to make a positive difference? The other thing that are happening in my little tax world is, as somebody used to say, there's more to tax than tax. So it's not just about collecting the taxes. So if you were a tax man, that was your job, and that's why you're there. You're getting the money so the government can function. But it's a little bit like Google. Google is not just a search engine. That gives you the data that allows you to do many other things. The same with tax administrations. Uh, Sandy talked very, very eloquently to that. And, and one example I came across recently is in Australia. They said, you know what, and this, if, if you have a taxpayer that during the day works as a nurse and at night drives drive as an Uber driver, you are high risk of contracting COVID. So I didn't think about that. Who would have thought tax data can be used for that kind of stuff? Or in another case, a, a jurisdiction uh, found out because they had access to detailed banking data that more money went to this country, this small country in Africa, than the total combined reported income by that population group in the country. Mm. What is going on, right? So uh, the tax field can go in and, and help with many things. Or you want a credit card, okay, you have to go through a credit card check. But what you can do in countries like Denmark, and, and I think you can do it also in Norway, you can say to the tax administration, you can share a reduced version of my tax file with a credit card company. So you can get approved within a couple of hours, right? Rather than you having to get all of your papers, scan them and send them. So that is part of, of this uh, uh, network uh, economy. And what does that mean? It's a little bit like agriculture. We used to have a lot of people in agriculture more than that. But right now it's totally mechanized. The same thing will happen in tax administrations. And they will then look at how is the system working? So the system is kind of running on autopilot and they will make sure it manages new challenges and so on. So they will shift to more of a stakeholder approach to, to manage the overall system rather than making the uh, systems uh, run on time. And I'm not going to go into this, but there is once you get into tax administration, there are a lot of issues you need to manage. We haven't talked about it. A lot of these change efforts, implementing new IT systems, go off the rail. The procurement uh, takes forever. Uh, the system doesn't deliver what we thought. Users don't want to use it. Uh, I think we just need to recognize there is a lot below that surface that will side rail uh, these uh, initiatives. And it takes a lot of time uh, to work with data because it's so complex all these systems tying together. So let me just stop here and, and thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Eidiskov. That was a, a fascinating metaphor about being both scary and invigorating. And I think uh, the more we think about the various dimensions that you brought in from the very, very practical level of taxation, which of course is, um, has been a practice for centuries to the more recent and innovative approaches to resource mobilization and also more importantly resource investment i think we will find that as we approach 2045 much of what we think of as dangerous or something we would not wish to tread upon will invigorate us and probably the reverse will also be true much of what we think will animate us will in in the long run prompt us to maintain a distance uh, I thought what I would ask now is for each one of you or each one of us to reflect on one point that you came across in our conversation today, which really struck you and share that with us so that we can have an idea of how each of the presentations has impacted upon others. But before doing so, Tuan, is there anything you would like to share with us? I'm sorry. Yes. Would you like to make any comments now? Or? Oh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, a great conversation and uh, ideas for new uh, concept and a new solution for uh, tax and trade in uh, also digital economy as the chat economy from uh, Professor Sandy Penland. Uh, I, 
I think uh, the best way we can invite uh, discussion as uh, uh, we have um, Professor Natalia Sevskaya from St. Petersburg University. She joined today as a discussion. So please. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, Tuan. So maybe if I may, um, uh, Dr. Shevskaya, I'll ask you to, to uh, put any questions that you have in mind, and then after that, come back to the panelists to ask each of them to give us one insight or thought that this conversation brought to them. Please. Uh, first of all, thank you for opportunity to take part in this great uh, event and uh, this great uh, conversation. Uh, I'm happy to be here, to see you here, and um, I want to ask one question, but before this question, I want to say the next point. Uh, today we have a big uh, challenge to prepare our society, our systems in every country to take uh, meet this uh, very large, very meaningful and uh, very uh, uh, very new technology like artificial intelligent technologies and uh, we should think how we can to help our people people in different countries to take meet this technology but uh, while we will thinking about uh, people we should think about systems uh, which work in every countries and all systems are very different and we should uh, keep it in our minds to uh, do this thing uh, which can and help us to develop uh, some universal approaches how to uh, implement artificial intelligence technology in a system where people live, where people work. And uh, my question is will be about um, the next point. Um, we know that every global economic initiatives will use uh, proprietary algorithms uh, like federated learning and etc approaches and all of these approaches have commercial value for each country and uh, my question is how we can think and what we should do uh, to uh, create uh, to grow up level of trust between uh, countries to use artificial technologies. Thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. That's a fascinating, I, I mean, I think that's one uh, one point that we haven't really addressed in detail, the question of trust, which is so obviously necessary to a collaborative. Who'd like to take that on? Please, uh, Dr. Penton. Uh, I think that um, one of the things that is also happening as a trend here is that uh, particularly on the technology side, is moving away from uniform systems. So I think it's inevitable that each country will have slightly different systems, different control over their national systems, quirks of various sorts. Um, but a lot of what's needed is just interoperability. And in the software world, that means, you know, application user interfaces and, and uh, protocols for logging or not logging things. And those can be very open. And, and so building trust may be more of a, a national uh, element or national project, but, but trust in exchange uh, may be the best path forward for uh, international digital public goods. And, and what I mean by that is today, for instance, uh, we have this system of moving uh, goods around the world, with bills of lading and uh, international payments and things like that. And it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. But it works pretty well and people trust it. But it doesn't talk about how things were created or what they're going to be used for in the different countries that are part of it. So perhaps starting with the uh, ability to uh, exchange data that's relevant for each of the countries uh, and it is is a great way to go. I also have to apologize that I have to, to leave very shortly. So uh, thank you for all that. No, thank you. And I realize that um, a number of us will will be constrained by time. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Pentland. Uh, if I may ask, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll ask uh, each of our panelists to both reflect on Natalia's question and also 
give an idea of what today's conversation has brought to them. Uh, Dr. Tilleman, may I start with you? Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Natalia's question is excellent in the interest of time. I'm going to defer on that, but pick up on something that uh, Jeff Saviano mentioned about the funding gap around the sustainable development goals. And what we've seen in, in our calculations is that if you rely on United Nations figures, simply closing the gap that currently exists around tax evasion and corruption worldwide would be enough to pay for the entirety of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we often view this as a nice to have uh, and, and addressing these challenges as a nice to have. This is a need to have. This is the entire ball game. If we can get this right, if we can use these technologies to enhance governance and bring greater accountability and transparency uh, to the way that resources flow throughout our economies, we can have everything else that is on the global agenda right now, from education to the elimination of poverty uh, to addressing climate change. So this really should be front and center in the way that we are approaching not only the issue of how do we harness technology more effectively on behalf of society, but how do we solve every single global challenge uh, that is on the agenda of the United Nations at this time? Thanks, thanks so much for that, uh, Dr. Chilliman. Uh, Dr. Saviano? Thank you very much, and thank you, Natalia. Such a, a great question. I can first address your question by uh, focusing on the need for greater transparency and uh, audibility uh, and the ability to explain the results from an AI system. Perhaps it's uh, one reason I uh, include the word audibility in, in that response is that I represent an audit firm here today, and we understand the value of the ability to audit, and in this instance, understanding how an AI system, how the algorithms are making those determinations. We think it's incredibly important that they need to be explained in order to realize the true value of an AI system. It won't be enough to merely look at the results. We need to understand the workings, the algorithmic determinations to ensure that there are no, for example, biases in that data that may skew the results. Uh, to get to the, the uh, closing points today, I just want to reflect on comments made by both uh, Dr. Pentland and Dr. Tilleman about the data revolution. And this, and I think we've all come in and out of this today. We mentioned we have looked across different projects in countries, and, and this is, I think, the most glaring need in the world are for data management systems relying upon many of the new technologies that Dr. Tilleman mentioned earlier, but those new data sharing management systems don't exist. One example we we just saw uh, in one particular country in the Asia Pacific region is managing 69 external data streams in order to better tax its citizens and, and needs help in managing that data in a fair and efficient manner. And we think that is something of immediate need in the world we need better technology systems to manage these data streams that are providing such great insights, and we apply that to um, to tech. So uh, I hope that's one takeaway for our participants today, is that there is a glaring need for that, and we believe that our Prosperity Collaborative um, uh, will be aligned to that helping uh, in the world. Now, thank you again for the opportunity to join today. Thanks so much. That's a fascinating perspective, the idea of data both being technology and requiring technology. Thank you. Thanks for that. Dr. Alkoskov? Thank you very much. Excellent question, Natalia. I think the trust is central. Why is it central? Uh, if I give up my data, it can be used for an almost good. So uh, my first published article was in The Lancet. Why? Because Denmark uh, collects all of the prescription information electronically and have done that for 40 to 50 years. And I worked with a doctor that had access to that and I was just running some prayers. Right? So I got my name on that. So just to show that if there's trust, uh, you can do fantastic things. With it. Right. So what does that mean? What does trust mean? So the way we have to address this, and we've done it through a number of ways, and this is continues to be a challenge. We talk about transparency being open, but also. Uh, uh, consultations. So if you are government, it's not okay to just present a massive legislative change 
uh, when it's going to Parliament to be processed. You need to have conversations about it, right? And, and you also know if you go into another field, uh, maybe you don't like a certain minority, but if you have somebody who's your friend, oh, but then it's very different. We know that. So I think we need to be closer. And it goes back to the social contract. Okay, I give you license to use my data for good. I trust you will do a good job. All there's some mechanisms in place. And if we have that, it's, I mean, it, it, it's just, that is the path to the enlightenment we are talking about, right? People willingly giving up this information, supporting its use, right? And if it's misused, then it will slowly stop. People will sabotage it. They will go offline, all sorts of other things. And I think what we need to do is to maintain that trust, not just between citizen and government, but also among governments. So if some governments are a little bit in the periphery, we need to bring them in. We need to have the conversation. Right? So a lot of work to be done, as to Mike and Jeff said, a lot of it is international in nature. And, and, and this is going to be a, at least a generation's work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I would only add that we also need to, to enhance the point that you've made about citizens and governments and governments and governments. Also, a greater trust between citizens and multilateral institutions. And uh, certainly the World Bank has been, in many ways, in the, mm. in the range of both informed and ill-informed ire amongst citizens, but so too is the United Nations. There's skepticism, there's despondence, and it's a very different world to go back to what our first conversation than the world of 1945, which despite the savagery and the brutality all around, was still one of hope when the United Nations was created. Thank you so much for joining in this uh, round table and in this conversation. I'll now defer to Tuan for his closing thoughts. Thank you so much, Ramu, and thank you so much, our speakers and panelists. We have uh, great uh, ideas on the uh, round table today. We had a uh, very practical solution and initiative, and uh, that is a prosperity collaborative. Uh, so uh, we um, work with them also that uh, our people here from two years ago, and uh, Jeff Saviano came to Vietnam to talk on uh, Vietnam television about this initiative already. So now we have very good progress in, and we hope this is a very uh, sophisticated solution and initiative to contribute for uh, the United Nation Centennial Initiative uh, for to shape the world for future 2045. And also the <coughs> Boston Global Forum and uh, the United Nation Academic Impact, we are uh, see this is a very important part for the uh, AI government. That concept we are proposing and introduced from uh, 2019. <clears throat> so, so it's uh, very, very good for AI government. And AI government also is a very important component together with AI citizen to help to ship for the world with AI and AI society, and also with um, the special genetic nation Central New. We continue together and <coughs> introduce our this initiative and this solution and how the progress and update <coughs> in uh, New Leicester. And uh, we, will, we hope we will have more talks to introduce that is an um, achievement in the practice and uh, implement of this initiative, this solution. And uh, thank you so much, the United Nations Academic Impact to the host and support. And uh, as usual, Ramu Damodaran is a great moderator for a uh, very uh, lively and very exciting. And thank for our participants and discussion special Natalia from uh, St. Petersburg University, uh, because uh, that means exciting that we have uh, all, not only uh, uh, men, we have Lady Joy here and uh, at discussion, not only all men, that is, uh, we, uh, that <laughs> we have female also, yeah, uh, in the round table. Thank you so much again, and we see you later. And please, uh, uh, panelists, please send me uh, your, pro, uh, your writing or your uh, 
PowerPoint we will introduce in AI WS new lecture on Monday. That is our roundtable today and also post on website Genetic Nation Central New York and uh, AI U Society website, Boston Global Forum website. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Behind the scenes. Sorry. Bye. 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 Bye.